Good morning. How's everybody doing? Or good afternoon, I guess. Hello, Brenda. I don't know if you jumped ahead of me or if you can hear me. You want to see me? I'm not that excited about that, but we'll put it up on here just, just for fun. Just for fun. I know you all want to see the cat, right? <laughs> it's so weird that I have a cat. I just don't get used to that. But uh, anyway. All right, good. You can all see me and hear me. Well, welcome to Trading Coaches Playbook. I'm hoping that this cough doesn't get out of hand. It, uh, it was, last couple of days, it's kicked up kind of bad. So I'm sipping on a little warm coffee, trying to keep the throat good. So <laughs> hello, sir, senor. Good morning, good morning, all of you. Yes, happy Friday. We're going to... Uh, for some of you, this might be a little bit of replay, but we'll go through the PowerPoint and then uh, we'll spend most of the time on charts playing with it. So, but let me get the disclaimer out of the way. I'm not a registered broker dealer investment advisor. I will not give you any recommendations or advice. Everything we do here is purely for educational purposes. If I do happen to mention a trade, just assume it is a paper trade or practice trade. For regulatory reasons, we do not discuss funded trading. Dawn, hey, I don't think I've seen you in a while. So good to see you. Glad you're all here. So. Here's what's coming up in the next little bit. Uh, looks like, I think this is all January stuff. Uh, Wealthful spreads on the 23rd, monster market movers on the 25th, uh, trading you January 30th. <laughs> I can't, Steve, if you want me to go back. Uh, <laughs> Steve says, can you say that faster? <laughs> I, already, I already talk super fast as it is. And just, we got to get that out of the way for a legal reason. So I just want to get it over with. Uh, but Mastermind Group is Tuesdays at eight. Uh, the Power Hour, Monday at noon. Uh, looks like skipping a week. Um, yes, the market is closed on Monday. Brenda asked if the market is closed on Monday. It is MLK Day. So the market is now officially closed. I think it used to be that there were six, if I remember right, there used to be six holidays a year where the market was closed. Now there's 10. I just saw that was somewhere. I can't remember where that was posted. I don't know if it was, maybe it was an email that we sent out that there's, there's 10 holidays now where the market is closed, where I'm pretty certain it used to be six. So, which I guess isn't a bad thing, right? <laughs> so uh, we need a little break, right? From the, the, the head games of trading, but trading coaches playbooks every Friday. Uh, Becoming a pattern whisperer is this next week, January 17th and 19th. Uh, at noon, morning, well, morning time for me on the 17th and then evening on the 19th. Uh, and then Power Option Plays Tuesdays and Saturday, Cover Calls Explorer Thursday, and E-Mini Think Tank with Brandon Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So, um, and Steve, feel free to tell me if I get going too fast. I have to work really hard to slow my pace down so that I'm not running people over because I, I sometimes get excited and my mouth tries to keep up with my brain and it doesn't necessarily <laughs> go well. The main thing I'm focused on right now is trying to keep this, this little cough at bay. So, of course, you can find us on all the uh, social media platforms. Uh, <clears throat> man, it's killing me. I even, Apparently, it's allergies, and I even took one of these allergy pills they gave me this morning, hoping that this wouldn't happen. But uh, So bear with me. If you haven't experienced patterns of flash, I would suggest you do that if you mm -hmm. are haven't experienced weekly whispers, then we'll talk a little bit about that today. So thank you, Miguel. Miguel just put a link in there. So if you do want to jump on uh, the two-week trial of Patterns in a Flash, you can grab that there. Um, <laughs> wow. Okay, crazy. <laughs> okay, take your time, Jennifer. No big deal. So um, she said, Jennifer said, I just found out there's a leopard loose in my neighborhood. Go and find my mail carrier and try to rejoin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. A leopard, where do you live? At the zoo? I don't know. That was a first. I don't think I've ever had anybody message in and say, I'm going to go check out the leopard. When it comes to trading, there's really two core functionalities that we have to play, right? And really, if you break trading down in its simplest format, that's all there is. There's two pieces. You got to analyze, you got to find an opportunity, right? That's the analysis side. And then you got to execute on an opportunity which is essentially the trading side, right? So we have to, if we're traders, 
we're also analysts, analysts, right? We have to go analyze the charts, right? Y'all go, y'all go look at technical analysis. You read the charts, you analyze it. You think this is what's going to happen. This is what I expect to have happen. Whatever you say, and then you have to go and trade it. And there really are two hats, right? Most brokerage houses, they have an analysis team and they have a trading team, and they don't intermingle the two. They make sure they intentionally keep them separate because analyzing a chart, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I don't really go look at charts and go, woo, I'm so excited. I mean, it's when you're learning and, you know, it's cool to see the patterns and how they play out and that's exciting, but I don't get emotional about it. I'm like, it, it's not doing anything for me because what is it producing? Nothing, right? You're just analyzing it and say, this is what I see. This is what I think might happen next. Now, when you place a trade, that's a whole different ball game, right? And I love what I, I love what Steve Nissen said best is that once you enter a trade, once you fund a trade, you are no longer in the driver's seat. You are merely a passenger. In other words, your emotions, it, it's very difficult. He even, I saw a video of his years ago. This is back in 2003, 2004. I had one of his um, training videos. He had, he had taped a, a live course he did in front of students teaching them about candlesticks. And he sat there on the video and he said, I don't trade my own account. I don't trade my own money. And it, I remember it clearly because it just took me back. I was, I was like, wait a minute, what? I mean, Steve Nissen's the guru of candlesticks, right? He's been credited by many as bringing them from the East to the West. So we have them here today, right? And he st stood right there in front of a group of people and said on videotape, I don't trade my own account. He said, I can't handle the emotional swings. He allows other people to do it for him. He basically recognized and acknowledged that he couldn't do the emotional side of trading, so he only did the analysis part. And I remember that was, it just, it kind of blew my mind at the time. But it's really an important distinction to make. We have to wear two different hats, right? You have to be an analyst first. You have to find the opportunity. And then you have to switch the hat around, flip it around and say, okay, now I'm a trader. Now you have to take that analysis and you have to act on it. You have to wear both hats. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, Brent. That was a perfect little segue. Brenda says, I need you to trade for me, LOL. Um, and that is, for those of you who don't know, I know some of you were here uh, Monday night, but we just launched Weekly Whispers, right? Which is essentially um, my analysis that I do every week. Um, you get that now. Every, I have 20 to 30 patterns that I typically come up with and find and basically set up trading opportunities. I analyze the charts. I put the trading plan on it, everything. And then essentially, I just videotape it. It's what I've been doing for a long time. And now I've just videotaped it. And now you have access to it as a, uh, a tool. So if you want the analysis side of things, I can get you the analysis part, Brenda. <laughs> that's what that's what Weekly Whispers is, right? Then all you have to do is manage the trades. So you don't have to do the analysis part. I spend usually three to five hours going through once a week. I used to do it every day, but it's, it's overwhelming. And a lot of times they're the same candidates anyway. So I do it once a week. I go through two to 300 stocks. I look for patterns. I filter it down to the best of the best. And then I set up my analyze them, draw lines, put a trading plan on it. And then all I do for the week is watch those trades. That's all I do. It's really not complicated. The hardest part is the trading part, the emotional side, managing your emotions. So I can give you the one part. Analysis, you can get all over the place, right? Depending on what you're trying to do. Some people are fundamentalists. Some people do, you know, everybody has their own trading style. The analysis is not the challenging part. The challenging part, the one thing I can't do for you, Brenda, is manage your emotions for you. <laughs> I just, that, that's one thing that you're the only person on the planet that can do that side. But this is one big question that I think is very important to ask yourself. Um, <laughs> Karen, I'm not sure what that means. Hard for a girl sometimes. I don't think the market cares what gender you are. <laughs> 
I think I know what you mean, but yeah, it's uh, and that's one of the beauties of the market, right? It is the great equalizer. Um, it doesn't care. It doesn't care where you come from. It doesn't care what degrees you have. It doesn't care, you know, there's no little um, clicks that you can be part of. You can't be the most popular kid in town. It, it, none of that matters. Market does not care. It doesn't care if you're male, female, black, white, purple, brown, pink. Doesn't matter. Doesn't care what your education level is. The market is the great equalizer. So, um, and that, that that's a whole new debate, Karen. <laughs> and I would challenge you on that. Karen says, we tend, to, we tend to be more emotional. I think that we all are equally emotional. It's just we display it in different ways, right? If you go to a bar and you find a bunch of guys in there, you know, a, a man disrespects another man, what happens? You know, they're fighting, right? That's an emotional display. <laughs> you know, they're taking out their, their anger on each other by beating each other, right? Fighting. Women tend to, you know, curl up in a ball and start crying, right? It's still an emotional display. It's just a question of, of how we display it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's always been a lot of people say that. And I hear people say that women make better traders because they get out and they're, I don't agree with any of that. <laughs> We're, people are people. We all have the same emotions. We all have anger, disappointment. You know, you can list off all the emotions here. We all feel them. It's a question of how we respond to them. I think that's the key. It's not... <laughs> Not that we're different emotionally, it's how we react to each of the emotions. Which is really the key to trading, right? And you're not alone, Brenda. You, everybody else in this room right now is saying, Brenda says, the hardest part for me is controlling my emotions. Exactly. The hardest part is the trading part. And that's why I say, but analysis you can get from all kinds of places, right? You can go to Rob, you can go to Brandon, you can come to me and get analysis. But we can't manage your emotions for you. We can't help you with the decisions. We can't help you decide to pull the stop and get out so it doesn't get worse. Those are things that only you can do. But here's the big question that I think is important to ask every single time when you're looking at trades. And it's something that's it's been recently hitting my brain. What compelling reason is there to act? If you have you analyze a chart or you come up with some reason to trade, what reason do you have to pull the trigger? Well, I want to make money. Well, that's not a good reason to get in the trade, is it? I think it's going up or down. Market doesn't care what you think. <laughs> it just doesn't. I like the company. Okay. What does that have to do with getting in now? It's launching a new product. So, you know, Apple, when the first iPhone came out, the first few iPhones came out, Apple went crazy when they released them. And now it's like, eh, nobody cares anymore. Right. Build a new factory. I saw this one the other day on one of these Facebook posts. All these people are all talking about Tesla. Tesla just committed a billion dollars to a new factory. Bye, bye, bye. Who cares? Actually, it's a reason to sell. Because if you if you're taking money out of your pocket, do you feel better when that money's gone? Or do you feel better if you keep it in your pocket? Of course, if you're investing it and you're expecting to get a return, but still in the short time, there's a hole in your pocket. And eventually you might get it back, might be in the keyword. But if you break these down, every single one of these reasons on here, they're all based in emotion. So once you analyze the chart, the question becomes, okay, you've got your analysis done. You, I think it's going to do this. I think it's going to do that. And the market doesn't care what you think. I mean, obviously we have to come up with an idea of what we expect it to do. But then you have to ask, is there a reason? And if any, any of these reasons come up that are emotional to react, then don't do the trade, right? It's not good. Here are some other reasons. Okay, a pattern's formed. Is that a compelling reason to act? Not necessarily. A valid setup. Valid. Notice the word valid, okay? I don't say a good setup, a valid setup. There's one that we talked about, or I did in the, the weekly whispers last week, the very first one. Um, the ticker symbol is O, and we'll go look at it here. It's down a little bit, but I remember saying the pattern is not technically perfect. It's not exactly what it should be. It's still there, but it's missing a lot of pieces that, so I don't necessarily consider it even a legitimate pattern, but you'd be amazed at how many times there's a pattern that's not that great, that maybe doesn't meet all the criteria, 
this still works well. This still plays out. But if there's a valid setup, not necessarily a good setup, but a valid setup, then you can trade it, right? If the risk reward is favorable, that's a compelling reason to act if you got the risk reward on your side. If an entry point is triggered, if you're comfortable with the risk, now that's a little bit more emotional, but if you know what your risk is going in, then that's a good way to manage your emotions, right? I know that in this trade, if I get in now and I get stopped out, it might cost me 200 bucks. I'm comfortable with taking $200 of risk. If God forbid it gaps and something crazy happens, bad news comes out, then I might lose 600. I'm okay with that. Now you've removed the emotions from that question, right? You're comfortable with the amount of risk you're willing to take. And the biggest thing there is the last question. <clears throat> Do you trust yourself to follow the plan? Trusting yourself is very important. It's, it's a critical piece. Because how many of you have gotten into a trade, you set up a plan, you had it all laid out. Okay, if it hits this point, I'm going to stop out. Lo and behold, what happens? It goes down and hits your stop. You don't have a hard order in there. You have an alert. It alerts you. It says, you're at your stop. Get out. And what do you do? Um, I'm going to wait. I don't want to lose. Hold on. And what happens? Okay, I'm down 200 bucks. And then you're down 300 bucks. Like, ah, oh, it's not good. I should have gotten out. Should have. And then what it should have, could have starts to kick in, right? That whole syndrome is deadly. You should have gotten out. Well, yeah, you should have. But then what happens? You say, okay, well, if it gets back up to 200, I'll take my loss. It goes back and hits my stop. I'll get out. It keeps going. Now you're down 400. Ah, oh, I should have gotten out 300. If it gets to 300, I'll get out. Then you're down 600. Ah. Next thing you know, you're like, when's expiration? <laughs> Can we hurry up and get expiration here so this thing gets out of my account because I don't want to stare at it anymore? It's frustrating me because I should have gotten out. And you know what happens then? Not only did you break your rules, but you broke trust with yourself. If you tell your wife or your kids, hey, we're going out to dinner on Friday night. And then Friday night rolls around and you work till 10 p.m. and you don't go to dinner. You don't take them to dinner like you said you were going to. Are they going to be upset? Yeah. Next time you tell them that you're going to take them to dinner, what are they going to think? Well, he didn't do it last time. Why would he now? Right? I <laughs> uh, love it, Amos. You have no idea how many times I hear that. Uh, Amos says, dang, how can you read my brain like that? It's so right. Because <laughs> if, you, if, if you don't know me, I teach from experience. Because I've been down that road many a times. Too many times. It's kind of embarrassing to admit, right? But it's human nature. It's what we do, right? But And that's one of the reasons I've learned it's so critical that you get to a place where you trust yourself to make a good decision, regardless of what you made a decision before you enter the trade. Stick to that plan. Because that one that you have expire um, is going to put a massive hole in your account, probably. Okay, and I've done it. I've blown up a couple accounts. Most traders that I know that have been doing it for more than a decade have blown up an account at least once, if not multiple times. It's uh, Trading is not easy. It's one of the reasons we're talking about this is you got to separate trading from analysis. You do the analysis, then you got to learn to trade. But that's what happens, right, Amos? And I'll give you another brain read. The next time you get into a trade, you set up your plan. You say, okay, there's my stop. In your mind, you're like, wait a minute. Just like the wife and kids going, are you really going to take us to dinner? Am I really going to stop out if it hits that point? Am I going to follow my plan? Do I trust myself to do what I said I was going to do? Because last time I didn't. Here's what I tell people. Follow the plan. Get out of this trade. Take your stop. Move on. Get your money back. And here's why. If you destroy trust with yourself, long-term, you're going to destroy your account, right? Just like if you continue over and over and over again to tell your wife and kids you're taking them to dinner, eventually they don't believe anything you say. The hard part is that we don't like to take a loss, right? 
So we justify in our minds hanging on so we don't have to take a loss. But taking that loss, no matter how much it is in dollar figures, is significantly less expensive to take the $200 loss or whatever it is than it is to destroy trust with yourself. The emotional toll that you take on yourself by not following your plan and not doing what you said you were going to do is far more significant than the financial hole in your account. That makes sense. I mean, it's it, when I realized that it was like, okay, I don't care what is going on. I'd rather take a two hundred or two thousand or five thousand dollar loss than kill my ability to make good decisions on my future trades. Oh, Brandon, I, I just remembered your brand. Brandon says, price, price for Tesla is supposed to decrease according to the talking heads. Yeah, talking heads. When the talking heads usually say something, do the opposite for the most part. Right? Whenever Kramer says something, do the opposite. <laughs> he's a good entertainer, but his analysis is often off. And he's kind of got that reputation in the industry. If Kramer says to buy them stuff. And that's, that's another point is be careful who you listen to. Right? I tell people, don't even listen to me. People come and say, well, you're an expert. I hate the term expert. That implies that I'm going to be right. And I know everything about it. And I don't. I got a 50-50 shot just like you do. Just because I may be able to analyze the charts better doesn't mean that I'm going to trade better. Right? There, there's two different ball games. They're almost two different planets, really. So I don't know what the liar liar part's about, but <laughs> I got the sarcasm trip. Yeah. <laughs> if there is no there is no sarcasm sign is there <laughs> trip says i've never blown up account either see sarcasm sign um brenda you are not alone uh, let's let's do a quick little poll among everybody brenda says sometimes i think i'm not cut out for this me too <laughs> trust me you're not alone everybody everybody thinks that at some point but you're gonna have good days and bad days Right. It's not much different than anything else in life. You know, whether you're, you know, you go to a job in your marriage, you know, raising kids, you second guess yourself. Right. It's natural. It's what we do. But what you have to do is. Keep reminding yourself of why you're working at it. I mean, if you have an issue with your kids or you have marital issues, then you go about figuring out how to adjust and adapt and correct things to get back on track. Training is no different. Right. Oh, good question, Kevin. If I have ten thousand dollars, what should, what percentage should I put to work at one time? Um, I have a rule for myself, and I mean, obviously, the market's kind of like the wild west. You can create whatever rules you want. Um, myself, I typically, well, I have a ten percent rule that says I won't put any more than ten percent of my account into any one trade. Right, that way, if one goes haywire, because sometimes news happens, right, and you don't expect it, you don't know what's going to happen, and it puts a huge dent in that one trade. Well, if you have no more than 10% of your account into one trade, then it doesn't hurt that bad, right? I mean, the most you're going to do is put a 10% dent in your account if it goes to zero. Um, <coughs> generally speaking, though, well, and, and that's where there's two different questions kind of that I'm, I'm pulling from that. Um, so that's my rule for maximum into a trade. Now, obviously, if you're working with you know $1,000, that's a little more challenging to only put a, 100 bucks into a trade. It can be done. There are stocks you can find that you can do that with. So if you have the discipline to do that and you can, I say do it. You might have to, though. If you're working with a smaller amount, you might have to bump up that percentage in the beginning you know, until you get to a spot uh, because $100 is, is, is pretty thin to put into a trade. Um, it's possible. Like I said, it's possible. It's just much more difficult. Um, I mean, with $10,000, I think that's reasonable. And I know you're just throwing it out as just an example, but um, I mean, that gives you $1,000 in a trade. If you put $1,000 into a trade and you're getting 60, 70% rate of return, if, if it goes the direction you want it to, you're in good shape, right? Um, but as far as how much capital to, to deploy, do you deploy the entire 10 grand? I typically stay right around 50%. I like to have cash on hand in case some opportunity pops up that is compelling. Um, Right now, I'm in 100% cash. I just closed out my last position. I took a small profit on Coke, and I'm in all cash right now because I, this market is just 
I, it's it's hard to tell what it wants to do or it might do next. Um, it looks like it wants to go bullish. And last week, almost all the candidates I had were bearish. <coughs> and now this week, they're almost all bullish. <laughs> and there's some good solid patterns. But yeah, I, I usually keep uh, about 50%. There are a few times this last year, there was a couple of times when we had a really nice, really, really pretty setup where I loaded, I was like 95 or 96% <laughs> deployed but that's rare usually i'm you know half to two-thirds generally speaking is about all i, I will have active in at one moment does that make sense so 10 percent rule and then usually half to two-thirds is about all i have deployed so good amos amos says i don't recall i looked at it like this before but it's very very right well, that was, that was, again, one of the reasons that I wanted to hit on this because it is, it's a critical thing to recognize. And I'm assuming you're talking about the, the two different hats and you've got to learn to separate the two, so. <laughs> okay, good, everybody's, yeah, everybody's been there, right? Yeah, you're not alone, Brenda. Kevin says, yeah, me too. Trip says, me three. Amos, hands up. Yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> you never will be, so. <laughs> Do I have a scan for cheaper stocks? I used to, Kevin, I used to have two different scans and I, I essentially combined the two where, um, I guess it depends on how you define cheaper. Are we talking like, you know, 50 cent dollar, $2 stocks? Or are we talking 15, 20, $30 stocks? Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure how you define cheaper. Cause I see, you know, a lot of these Facebook groups are funny. I see these guys, they go buy 10, 10 contracts of a nickel, nickel option that expire in three days. <laughs> They're throwing 50 bucks at it. It's a Hail Mary, basically. So um, Brenda said, thank you guys for the encouragement to everybody that raised their hands and said, yes, that's me too. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, you have to, you'll have to define cheaper for me, Kevin. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because <laughs> it's all relative, right? I mean, if you look at... Uh, That's okay. I'm just not, I'm not clear on exactly what you're defining. So give me a, give me a little more specifics. I'll, I'll come back to that. But so here's an example. This is why I look for patterns, right? Here's Home Depot, an example, a nice double top pattern shows up. We create the plan. We got the stop. We got the target. We put those two numbers into the risk reward calculator. We got five bucks of risk, 15 bucks of upside. So we have three times as much profit potential as we do risk. And boom, what happens to Home Depot? It tanks. We're looking at a six to eight percent move in about a week. That's going to be a nice, healthy profit if you're trading an option, even if you're shorting the stock. That's a good setup. But notice that I had a plan in place. And all I did, I analyzed the chart. I find the pattern, analyze the chart, set up a trading plan, and then it just follow the plan. Let whatever it does, it does. It's going to do its thing, no matter what happens. Right. But it is absolutely critical that you separate the analysis part. You take the analysis hat off. You do your analysis first. Take that hat off. Now I'm just going to trade based on that analysis. Now, now you've got to manage the trade. You've got to execute it. And the most important part is managing your emotions. The one thing that we all do, right? You start second guessing your analysis. Mm -hmm. You look at the chart and then something changes and you look at it and you go, oh, well, what about this? What about that? And you start to second guess things. You can't do that. Even if your analysis is off, so what? That's how we learn, right? If you go back, you do a trade, and that's one way I learned years ago, 21, 22 years ago, when I first started trading, because that was a big question that we always asked is, how much time do you go look at? Do you look at three months, six months, a year, two years worth of the chart? How much of the chart do you look at? And I remember numerous times when I started trading, I'd get into a trade, I'd look at six months or years worth of time, analyze the chart, and then go place a trade and get stopped out. And then, like, well, what happened? Did I do something wrong? What's, what did I do wrong? And then I'd go look at the entire history of the chart. Oh, well, look at, you know, five years ago, there was this massive support or massive resistance at that spot. And all of a sudden, I'm like, well, why don't I go back and look at the entire history in the beginning and find those major points that might affect my trade today? 
And if you're using Omega charts, then it's really super simple, right? You just hit a couple of keystrokes. You can see, I mean, you got D for daily, W for weekly, M for monthly, Q for quarterly, Y for yearly. So you hit a couple of keystrokes, you know, you get the monthly, most of the time you're seeing the entire chart. There's only a handful of stocks that you'd have to hit Q to go to quarterly. So learn to analyze things well. You don't have to be perfect. It never is anyway. And then stick to the analysis. All right. Should we go play now? And let me make this a little bit bigger. Where are we at? Okay, I got to look at that. Okay, good. Got a little deeper into that than I was planning on, but that's okay. It's fun anyway, right? So let's see. I'm curious where things are at. And this is, I just restarted this account. I figured, you know what? We're, we're launching a Weekly Whispers this week. I restarted this account to track it. And if you're not using Omega Charts, like this, this practice trading thing, it's not, uh, it's not as realistic as something like a, you know, your brokerage house would have. But the reason that I, I, I learned this in November, the reason I love it is it tracks data, right? You can come up here and hit reports and it will show you where things are at, right? It'll show you your percentage, win, win loss percentage of 50%, six trades. Now these are closed trades. They're not, it doesn't, it doesn't pull any data from the open trades. This account's down a little bit. Total net profit's down 1700 bucks. It's a million dollar account. 1700 bucks is nothing. <coughs> really less? Uh, I haven't really used it that much. Less as Toss has a horrible practice trading platform. The one I have, at least what I use, basically mimics the real stuff. Um, of course, you've got, you know, you don't know if it's going to hit in the spread. So there's little nuances like that. But for the most part, it's, it's good. The only reason I love this is for the tracking purposes. Because I hate <laughs> going in and tracking all the trades and, uh, you know, having to journal all that, that. That bookkeeping type of stuff is tedious to me. I can't stand it. Having to punch it all in, it's just too time consuming. And when I realized that there was an ability to trade like this with this and it tracks it all, I was like, beautiful. Even though it's not the perfect practice platform, it still gives me an idea of where I would be. So yeah, I'm right there with you, Trip. <laughs> Toss is okay, but Omega Charts is, for end of day charting, hands down, Omega Charts will blow anything away. I don't like the charting, the charting platform on Toss, I don't like. I love this. I've been using this for probably 20 years. I think we started with what, TC2000? But then they weren't accommodating us and these guys would. They'd give us things we wanted and asked for and they'd change things so that they would accommodate actual traders. The other people were just like, no, we're gonna do what we want. And I love, I love, I love this platform for an end of day platform, so. Yeah, exactly, Darla. <laughs> the, the practice platform doesn't make them any money. It's a marketing tool, right? To be able to tell people that, you know, I would imagine there's just some, I mean, I know coding and stuff is hard, but they got to change some stuff on the back end. I mean, I, I would imagine they could just duplicate the real platform and just take the money portion out of it. But I don't know. I'm not a developer or a coder. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not abnormal, Brenda. So the love toss took me over a year to get my charts the way I want them. And it is, there's a learning, especially when you're starting, there's a learning curve. You know, once you've been doing it for 20 years, like I have, if you switch from one platform to another, it's not that difficult. You've, I've used probably 15 or 20 over the years. And, uh, you know, they, they've all got their little nuances, but for the most part, their functionality is the same, so. Yeah, a lot of duplication and redundancy. So, so here's Cognizant. There, there's a, um, I guess you guys are going to get some freebies today. <laughs> there's a nice, nice looking inverted head and shoulders. So we'll see how that, that is uh, right there. In fact, that's one that I triggered this morning. But here's the issue with this. And this is one of those things, you know, from a, a in, the mindset perspective side is when you look at this thing and we were literally 54 just about three weeks ago, we just hit 68 yesterday. 
What are the odds of this thing continuing to run like it has been? Because when you look at previous rallies, you got, you know, this rally here from 54 up to 62, and then it dropped. I'm assuming that's earnings right there. It must be. We had this big rally after that massive drop. We had this big rally, little island reversal there. Ooh, I just noticed that. Is it? Nope, not quite. <laughs> it was for a minute there, but it came back and filled it. Absolutely, Kevin. And who else asked for something? Oh, yeah, shocker, Brenda. Cues. <laughs> um, I guess we should look at the overall market first, huh? Do a little top-down analysis. Um, yeah, we had an island reversal going there, but then it came in and filled it and launched from there. A little hammer there, right? But this big rally right here was followed by a big drop. These big rallies like this, they don't often just keep going. So if you get your mindset into an odds perspective, when you're analyzing a chart and you go, okay, this thing's run a bunch. But most of the time, stocks either settle down and they go sideways, they form like a flag or a pennant type of pattern. They kind of dance around for a week or two. And it's like catching their breath, right? And um, <laughs> thanks for the reminder, Tripp. Um, <laughs> It, I use this cheesy analogy, but it works for me, right? If this was me sprinting up a hill, especially after the last three months and the 20 pounds or so I've put on, I would be exhausted very quickly and I'd have to catch my breath. And stocks aren't much different. If it rallies like this, the odds are that it's either going to go sideways or it's going to have a retracement before it continues to rally. So don't get, I mean, I don't get too excited when I see these big runs. In fact, I would rather see this thing come and dance around on the 63 level somewhere in that area for the next week or two. But here's where it gets interesting is what happens if it does keep running? And here we'll put the trader hat on now and, and try to think like a trader. Do you want to miss it? No, of course you don't. So you think it might continue to run to the 70-50 target, but you also think the odds are that it will retrace back. How do you balance that out? How do you deal with the fear? The fear is that it might pull back and I take a big hit and I get stopped out. The other fear is it might run without me. You put those two fears on the scale, how do you balance them? Well, let's say you would do a thousand shares normally. Maybe you just do two or 300. You say, okay, I, I, I don't know if it's gonna keep running or not. I'm scared I'm gonna miss it, but I'm also scared because the odds are high that it's gonna go sideways or drop off. So instead of doing a full position, you just do 200, maybe 300 shares, two or three contracts, whatever the numbers are. It's an easy way to balance out the fear because now, okay, if it runs without me, if it runs, then I'm there. I'm still making a little bit. If it turns around and stops me out, I don't take a big loss. Right? Make sense? So that's a, a strategy or a skill for trading, a mindset skill, a mindset solution, if you will. And those are in the Weekly Whispers. I've got almost six hours of additional bonus video in there. And I cover that. There's 151 minutes in there of mindset skills. You're getting a couple freebies today. Um, where is that one? This is one, the one I was talking about earlier. I'll do this and then we'll look at your guys' stuff. We're going to go to Q's first. Let's see. Was that it? I didn't miss any bills. Q's, Tesla, and then IBM. Repeat that. Repeat what, Darlo? The fear part? <laughs> you got to forgive me. Sometimes it's, I say something and then my mind goes elsewhere um, before I see your comment. <clears throat> Let me get a cough out first. Oh, the fear part. Okay. So what's the two fears, right? This is a, this, here's an example of one. And this is, this is what I actually did. It got stopped out this morning. Um, so I'm going to put the analysis hat on real quick. And I'm analyzing this and I see a symmetrical triangle, right? It's pretty obvious to see when the lines are on there. But is it a good symmetrical triangle? Is it a high odds pattern? Well, a symmetrical triangle is a pattern that you typically see in a trend. It's a continuation pattern, a continuation of the previous trend, except we've got this massive long, like two months trend, basically straight down. And there's not really a trend in front of the pattern itself. This is simply a retracement of the downtrend. So technically, you want to see a symmetrical triangle in an uptrend. And here we just have a retracement, essentially. So that part makes it less appealing. 
And then the other thing with the triangles, you typically want to see it break out between about the halfway point of the triangle, which is about there, and approximately the three quarter points, which is about right there. And this thing for two weeks was just going right into the apex. It was just sitting there dancing. It wasn't doing anything. The further it gets into the point on a symmetrical triangle, not a wedge, they're different, <laughs> but on a symmetrical ascending, descending triangle, it should exit the triangle by the three quarters point. The further it goes into the point, into the apex, the weaker the pattern becomes. So sure, we've got the pattern, but it's not really in an uptrend. And it's gone so far into the apex, I'm not that excited about it anymore. But I still had a plan on it. I thought, well, if it breaks out, what do you do if it does? Here we go, Darla. This is, this is where I'm going. I had to prep it up there. It's not a great pattern. I'm not in love with it. There's all kinds of problems with it. It's not that strong. It's getting weaker and weaker. And you have two fears, right? I'm going to miss the trade. Or it's a weak pattern. And so if I do get in the trade, I might get stopped out. How do you balance those two? How do you, how do you address that fear? Because that's the driving thing that, that makes all of our decisions, right? Is fear, the fear factor. People say fear and greed. I think the greed part is just the fear of missing out. The FOMO that everybody likes to call it now. That's greed. You say, well, I don't want to miss the trade. I, I want to make money. You're scared you're going to lose out on opportunity, right? So how do you balance those two things? By taking a smaller position. You say, well, the pattern's not that great. It's, the odds aren't that great. So instead of taking a full position, maybe you would do 10 contracts or 1,000 shares, whatever you're, whether you're trading stocks or options. Instead of trading a full position of 10 contracts, I'm just going to pick up two or three. So you take the analysis side that says, there's a pattern. It's not that great of a pattern. I really don't love it. I'm not that convinced it's going to move big. But then all of a sudden, you switch into trader mode and you go, but I don't want to miss it. And the emotions kick in. You go, okay, now I flip the hat around. Now I'm trading. What am I going to do with it? Just execute on the trade, right? But the analysis says it's not that strong. So you cut down the position size. So your risk is smaller. So if it doesn't play out, since the odds are that it may not, now, if it stops you out, it doesn't hurt as bad. In this case, I did, uh, I think we, I think I can get in there and see, I'm still learning where some of this stuff is. Uh, trade, so here's the O trade. Can I open that? No, there's a, I think it's a journal. When was that, yesterday? This is one of the things I love too. You can save, when you go place these trades, you can save the charts. And it shows you everything you did. There's, oh, there's, oh, there's solo. Yeah, this got triggered this morning. So there is, oh, that's the, that's the exit or the entry. I think I, maybe I got in Tuesday. There it is. Oh, that's just an order. By 500, did I hit 565? By 500, oh, it's 6531 stop. I don't know if it hit or not. Okay, so this is one I put in. So this is what I was looking at before, right? I mean, you can see what it's done now. Move this over a little bit. Well, I can just go like that. And then I saw the screen. So you can see what's happened now, but this is what I love about this practice bubble. I can go back and say, okay, this was on 110 at 833. And this is what I was looking at. So I did the analysis, same. You can see that hasn't changed. But I put an order in for 500 shares of that well if it hits it. By 500, it didn't trigger it. I don't think it did. So then that was, then Wednesday, it must be in here somewhere. There's Coke, Abbott, there it is. So here's by 300. Because I looked at it and this was 659. So this is just 30 minutes after the open. I'm looking through charts going, well, what am I gonna do with this? Okay, well, it looks like it's starting to break out of there, above there. Maybe it will go. This is what I was looking at at the time. And I put in an order for 300 shares at 
right? Buy it, buy 300 at 6531 stop. So it's a buy stop. So if it runs up to that point, it's going to hit it. And it did. And there it is actually um, 1001. So this was a 714 AM, 1001, it filled. Uh, I haven't figured out how yet to save on the autofills like that to save the image. But then I went in, I noticed it filled it. I didn't even know it did at the time, but I went in and I put a stop at, what is that? 1059 AM sales stop? I don't know, what is it, 6609? Oh, I'd moved it up. Yeah, it had run far enough. It made sense to move the stop up. So I put, yeah, there it is. Okay. So here it is at 1044. And this is where I put the stop at, I don't know where was it? I don't know what that number is, 6609. That doesn't make any sense. I don't know what that is. But then it hit, this morning it, it stopped out. <laughs> I can't play now, Kitty. Busy. <laughs> She's coming to say hi. Oh, we're on Friday. Yeah, so this morning it stopped out at 66. I just moved the stop up as it ran because it ran big that day. The next day it ran up too. And I moved it up to, I think I put it on like 6601 or 62. So it stopped out this morning, but who cares? I got in at 6531, got out at 66. So 70 cents, not a killing, right? But that's 70 cents on six. It's about one or 2%. I don't know. <laughs> There she go. She's in the mood to play. <laughs> she brought me her toy. She's like a dog. She'll bring something. She'll jump up on the desk. She'll drop it. I'll throw it for her. She'll go retrieve it and then come back and drop on the desk again. It's pretty hilarious. Anyway. Um, yeah, I got to speed up a little. Um, exactly. Amos. Amos will just take, just take a few contracts. So then you're not fully loaded. Exactly. That's uh, precisely the point, which is what I did. Normally I would do 10 contracts on something like this, but I just did three because the pattern, the analysis says it's not that strong of a pattern. The odds are that it's not going to move big. So don't take a lot of risk, but at the same time, I don't want to miss it. Right? So instead of doing 10, I would do three. In this case, to answer your Kevin question or <laughs> your Kevin question, to answer your ke question, Kevin, that's a tongue tire. Um, I tried, there is, there is options in here in the practice platform account but it doesn't work that well. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta get rid of her. <laughs> there, go get it. Um, I, yeah, I played with the options a little bit so that I could try to mimic it uh, as close as possible, but they really didn't trigger well at all. So I basically have set up, the Weekly Whispers account I set up as a million dollar account to mimic a $100,000 options account. Um, <coughs> Because basically you're getting you get about a 10 to 1 leverage on options, right? For every one percentage point the stock moves, you get about a one, a 10% move in the option. So if you get a 10% move in the option or in the stock, you're getting about a hundred percent move in the option, right? So I essentially set these up and the pattern of the week is a hundred thousand dollar account to mimic a ten thousand dollar options account. Because the options really just did not trigger well at all. And I don't know what it looks like as far as data goes, and I didn't want to mess with it. So does that make sense? So in this case, I would have bought three contracts instead of 300 shares. So you just have to mentally calculate out that, okay, it would have been three contracts. All right, let me jump to your guys' now that I've got a little bit off rails. Uh, the queues, not sure what that's for. They're just updated. Yeah, the NASDAQ is still kind of stuck in this range between you know 2,900 and 2,600. So it is, uh, yeah, it's essentially just going sideways this morning. Banks came out and said things are challenging. They're, almost, they're, they're thinking they're not going to be as bad as they expected, but there's still headwinds ahead. Is essentially what a lot of the banks said. So if we go back and look at the long-term chart, it's not unfeasible. I mean, we've got this support level at 264, which is pretty solid. If it cracks that, there's really not much stopping it from going down to about 233 maybe even 216. There's a little bit in there. But as of right now, 
You know, there's a little double bottom there. And this is what you're going to see with Tesla. Google did the same thing. Is you got a little miniature double bottom. It's not really spectacular. It's not something I would be excited about trading off of. I don't know what that's doing there, but. So the question becomes is, you know, again, here we've got a five or six day run, which is pretty significant. What's going to happen? Look back here and you look at previous moves. You've got this move, which I think this was CPI. Yeah, this was CPI. But it moved really heavy for four or five days. And then for a month, it went sideways. So we've got a four or five day run here. If we get another move to the upside, we're probably going to see some sideways action or a retracement. Same thing here, right? We came down this 264. Boom, we run for a week or two and fall right back a week or two later. So same thing here. We got to bounce. And I, this is very similar. It looks a lot like what we have now. Right. I don't know that we're going to get, I can't remember what news that was. There's some kind of news catalyst that did this. This might, might've been CPI as well. <laughs> is the mailman okay? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Jennifer's back. You do look, I joke, I don't know if you're still in room or not, but I joked, I asked if you were living in a zoo. <laughs> she lives close to a zoo. That must be fun. At least it gives some entertainment, right? So yeah, right now, I mean, that's part of the reason I literally just closed out my last position today and I'm in cash until we get some kind of signal of what direction this market might be going next. I just don't know. It's, it's so hard to figure out. So I'd rather sit on the sidelines and wait. You know, we've got this little range that we were stuck in. So there's a little bit of support kind of in this area and we're bumping up against it right now. So I did, I guess that's what was there before. So that's what I see with the queues. We've got this line. We probably have, yeah, the 200 days coming in. If we make it through that line, we got the 200 day, which the SPX is hitting. It's right on. It's 200 day. You see, there's the SPX spiders, but SPX, same thing. Um, Tesla, whoops. Whoa, what's going on there? Looks very similar to the Q's, except that the Q's broke and kept running higher. Miniature little double bottom, not that excited about it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Are you just bringing up Tesla to pour salt in the wound? <laughs> I tried really hard not to get cranky about it, but uh, I'm going to close that actually. Here's the interesting part is you've got really this massive head and shoulders, which this is the beauty of patterns. If you don't believe in patterns yet, then <laughs> come join me for a week or two and you'll see if this pattern which this is a giant giant head and shoulders but I, I think this comes down to like about 50 if i remember right it's a 200 point drop so if the pattern itself plays oh it goes further than that even it goes down to like 20 but realistically i mean there's not much to stop it from going all the way to 60. And there's your, you know, what's this? Is that the COVID? That's the COVID crash. Obviously, it was starting to accelerate before COVID. But <laughs> COVID crash took it all the way to 2850. Isn't that crazy? Literally went from, well, this is split adjusted, remember? It was actually, gee, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, it was 150 or 160. But it was essentially, I mean, split adjusted was it? 29 bucks and it essentially ran to 400. I mean, that's what, 1200%. I mean, I would have been selling if, if, if I was Elon too. He, he knew that the stock was overvalued at this price. He knew that it was way too high. He's not stupid. People are like, oh, he's selling for Twitter. No, he's selling because he knows that people are too excited about the stock and the long-term value of it, I think. So, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it fell off a cliff and I, I have been a little bit cranky because is this weekly already? Oh yeah, that is weekly. Because I missed this last move. I was in and in this section right here, in this area, I got out. Because I got out because of CPI right there and I, I should have re-entered the trade. It was good to get out. I made a good decision to get out of the trade, but I should have re-entered and I didn't. And so I was cranky that I missed this, but I caught a lot of this. I caught uh, pretty much all this move. I caught a piece of this move. So I'm not, I, I shouldn't be, I need to remind myself that I got some good chunks out of Tesla. So. I can't complain too much about it. But as far as what's happening next, you know, I'm looking at this. I've got a, a potential, if it breaks north of this, these little highs that has been hitting in the last week or two, if it breaks north of that, I think there's a decent chance of 
a rally. How far, how fast, hard to say. And I think a lot of it would probably be based on short covering. That's where when you get something that's sold off this hard, I mean, we're down 60% in the last three, four months. There's a lot of people shorting this stock here. And if they start to get squeezed, it's probably going to pop some. So that's where I'm, I'm watching it for a short term, you know, one, two, three day pop to the upside. But they've also got earnings coming up. So, you know, we just started earnings season. So you got to be cognizant of that, obviously. Um, IBM, you know, and I'm just going to kill all that. And we'll start fresh. Uh, is that General Mills, Gregory? I think that's what you're asking for. Okay. I'm going to hustle. Only got, a only got a few minutes. So IBM, long-term, there's weekly. This is when you probably have to go back to quarterly. You see the whole thing, yeah. But I'm not going to do that. So I'll go back here and I'll draw all the major spots that I can see. Yeah, that's basically, I'm going to let my OCD win right now. Whoops, weekly. Well, certainly a uh, bullish bounce. You see a breakout of that 140 in a big way. And then it dropped off and dug right in. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some, some, it was support here at 145. You know, it's, it's a little bit there. There's not anything significant. Whoops. Uh, obviously, earnings coming up on the 23rd, it looks like. So that's one of those things. But um, yeah, I don't I mean, what to do with this. I mean, you could trade it from here. If it breaks north of this, it might run back to 150. I would say it probably will. But you got to be cautious of earnings if it drops back down here. As far as you know, what to do right now with it, I would maybe take a small trade up to 150 if it breaks north. But that's another one where there's not really any significant pattern that I can see that well, going back to the PowerPoint, what compelling reason is there to get into this trade right now? The only thing that would compel me to enter the trade from a bullish standpoint is if it breaks north of that. And even then, I don't see a spectacular pattern, something that's like spectacular, like that's just a great pattern. I love it. It's just an old support that's really, really weak. So I don't see anything really compelling, at least for me. I mean, if you see something that I don't see, and that's the beauty, right? We all analyze things differently. You may have a different trading style than I do. Um, and it's not that it's a bad trade. It's a valid, it's a, it would be a valid trade if it broke north of there and look for a run to 150, which is about five points. You know, you'll get probably 20 to 50% ROR on an option trade. But for me, this isn't something that would, I don't see anything there that's compelling enough for me to pull the trigger on it. I'd rather go find something else. GIS though, I believe was on my radar. Yes, it is. In fact, I've got, um, an entry point. I've got two different sell stops on this thing. You read my mind or did you get weekly whispers? <laughs> I don't think I was just this on. I don't think it was on the radar last week. Um, well, I'll go back to Tesla in just a second. So here's what I see with GIS. This is an all-time high, I think. Yeah, we're at an all-time high on General Mills. which is rather interesting. And you can see the longer term trends that's in place here. Well, not super long term, but over the last two or three years. But we have kind of a descending triangle and typically you would see this in a downtrend. It's not a topping pattern. It's not, a, it's not one of those. Uh, but <clears throat> just because like I showed you on O, right? Just because it's not the perfect textbook pattern doesn't mean that it's not there. It doesn't mean that we can't utilize it as a potential for a trade. Do we put less stock in it and maybe take a smaller position because it's not as good as some other ones? Absolutely, right? It's not much different than if you're a poker table and, and you get you know, a pair of deuces, which would you have, a pair of deuces or a pair of aces? This right here is like a, a pair of fours or a pair of fives. It's not that spectacular. There are some patterns though that, okay, I have a pair of aces now. Now you have the odds on your side, right? But there's essentially what I see is, you, and you've got, a very solid, I mean, this thing is dancing on that line, the 8250 line, and it's held it very well up until now. And we've got a very solid, I mean, it's, it's very short term, but at the same time, this thing is on that line. It's hit it one, two, three, four times. So as soon as it hit it here, we had confirmation that the downtrend line is good. We got another confirmation here. Now we're challenging the support. 
if it breaks down, I would venture to guess it's coming back down to this, this trend line, which also would be the major move if it was the textbook pattern. So in fact, I've got two different trade out here on 82.32. And this is, this is another thing. If you want to talk about controlling fear, this is one thing I talk about in weekly whispers all the time. Um, I talk about it everywhere all the time. I've got an order to sell 300. I don't know if you can all read that. It's really small, I'm sure, for you. Up in the left corner, sell short. Basically, I'm shorting it, which I would be buying puts if I was doing an option, right? Sell short 300 at 82.32. The entry point's 81.89. But if it cracks, I think I went off of this low. Yeah, the low of, the low of yesterday is 82.36. So I thought, you know what? If it cracks the low, I'm going to stick my toe in the water. I mean, do you ever go to a strange pool or a strange body of water and not make sure it's deep enough if you're going to dive or you stick your toe in the water to find out if it's <laughs> the temperature is okay? Yet we come to the market and we just dive in head first, not knowing how deep the water is or if it's even warm. So why not just stick your toe in the water first to find out? And that's what I do often. So I'm going to buy, or short, excuse me, I'm going to sell short or buy puts is, is what I would do in a funded account at 82.32 if it cracks this low. And then if it hits the 81, 89, I'll add in a full position. I'll go 700 more. I'll add 700 for a full thousand shares or 10 contracts at 81, 89 at the actual entry point. And again, going back to that fear thing, it bounces out the fear because if it just barely cracks down and I get in just like it did here, right? It came down. And if you got in right here at the 82, 32, then you get stopped out, but you have less risk, right? Instead of 81, 89, you're saving yourself 50 cents of risk. And you also add 50 cents of extra profit potential. So you get in with a small position. So if it just, if it moves down just a little bit, it puts you in, but it's only 300. If it continues, by the time you get to 81.89, you're already in a little bit. You're already profitable on some of it. So now when you get in, your cost base isn't 81.89 on a thousand shares. It's more like 81, probably 70. If you get in at 81.89 and your cost base is 81.70, you're already profitable. Now you could theoretically, if you wanted to, even move the stop down a little bit lower. In this case, I probably wouldn't, but in some cases, that's what I would do. Now you're in a full position and you're already ahead of the game, right? And now you're feeling better because, hey, I've already got a couple hundred bucks of profit and I just entered a full position instead of waiting to enter the whole position at that spot. Does that make sense? Okay, Amos, I'm going to look at this real quick, and then we got to call it a day. Weekly uptrend line that is on Tesla. Oh, on the weekly. Let me get rid of that thing, I think. Are you looking at semi-log? I'm not sure what you're seeing. This is where it gets tricky. You know, when you're chatting in there, and <laughs> you say, well... Or are you talking about the really short term? Are you talking about saying that this is a trend line? I don't see a trend line there, but I'm not sure exactly what you're you're uh, saying. I'm not I'm not seeing what you're seeing, Amos. That doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just I'm not seeing what you're describing via text. So I didn't miss anybody's, did I? We got everything. I think we had cues. Let's go back real quick. Any other questions, real quick, before we call it a day? Tesla, IBM. Yeah, the market's in the, just really kind of weird right now. I mean, it's always it's always challenging, but it's a question of you know what's next. I mean, if you look at the Russell, the Russell's running like mad, which is one reason where there we go, which is one reason that I'm starting to think that you know over the next few months we might. Um, we might be bullish. I mean, the Russell, even though it's not necessarily correlated to the other markets, if you go back and look at, is that, yeah. Oh, we're still on logarithmic. That's why I was like, no, we're not. I guess we're not. This period right here, the rest of the market was still running. Even though the Russell was stalling out and going sideways. Maybe... Yeah, so this back in, in 2021 20, is when the bear market kind of officially started, at least for a lot of tech stocks, especially the smaller companies. 
the rest of them went sideways while the other three major markets were all still running north. The Russell is the small caps, right? And I've made this argument before from a big picture perspective, the aircraft carrier out in the ocean can withstand a major storm. The little guy in the fishing boat, he's got to turn and haul tail back to shore before the storm gets there because he's going to get destroyed in the storm, right? These are the little companies. And you've probably all heard over the years that, you know, the small businesses it makes up 85, 90% of all businesses in this country. And they lead us out of a recession. Well, if they lead us out of a recession, they also would lead us into a recession, right? The inverse is also true. And the fact that this went sideways the entire year, basically all of 2021, the Russell went sideways. False breakout here. This right here is when the market started to trail off. The big, the other major markets, the SPX. You see here, this is, well, there's January. See, there's January where the Russell started to peak out back here and the SPX kept going. And then it finally turned over. You can see that beautiful looking trend line and we're sitting right at that. If we break north of that, and you can see actually there's an inverted head and shoulders right here on the SPX. I think it's there on the Russell too. The trend, uh, the, eh, not, it's not as pretty, that's for sure. It's more of a double bottom with the right cheek up. I guess you could say it's two heads. But this is, if, if we break north of this, then yeah, actually I think we might, we might run. I mean, that's, considering I've been bears for a year and a half, two years, it's, Sometimes it's hard to change that opinion and be like, yeah, I don't know if that's really going to be, but I mean, we're looking at probably running to, you know, we, we could come up and challenge that high again. You know, what just happened there? I think that's a stretch based on, you know, the macroeconomic picture, but who knows? The pattern's there. The question is, will it play out? The NASDAQ is not there yet, though, either. The tech, the tech companies are still just beat down. And I don't know that that's going to change it all either. I think this is probably, this might lead us further down. I, we never know. That's why we look at patterns. That's why you adjust your plan based on your analysis and go, okay, I don't know what is happening right now. That's where I'm just in this limbo spot. So I'm like, I'm out. Until I get some good indication from the chart. Until there's some signal, some valid signal that says, now is the time to get in long. Now is the time to go bearish. I'm just sitting. The trader hat is off. I'll, I'm in just pure analysis mode right now. So, all right, thanks, Darlo. I know I got to call it quits. I just realized I'm almost 10 minutes over. <laughs> Whoops. This is why I talk fast. I, it's so much I like to share. But anyway, if you want to get into weekly whispers, jump in. Um, I don't know if Miguel put the link in there, but you can get in that. There's obviously the two week trial. You can jump on, onto that and come out uh, or come out Monday and we'll talk more about that. I think it's Monday, 17th and 19th. So awesome. Thanks, Miguel. He just dropped it in there. So two week trial there. You can go jump on that. Thank you, Helen. You too. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Brenda. Appreciate that. See you Monday, Kevin. More fun. So thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that. All right. I'll take care. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.